Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. So I have a bit of a treat for you today. I know it's not Sunday, but I recently got a chance to chat with a farmer I've been wanting to chat with for many years, uh, Mr. Max Epstein of Krautgart, an intensive no-dig market garden in the tiny country of Luxembourg. Anyway, I wanted to use this interview not only to highlight the cool work they're doing there at Krautgart uh, with their collaborative farming model and CSA and no-dig methods that you'll hear a lot about in this conversation, but I also wanted to point you all to our No-Till Growers podcast channel here on YouTube, where we are always posting our podcasts, but are going to increasingly start posting many of long-form videos like this with the interviews that you hear on those podcasts. So if you like this, if you like our podcasts and enjoy being able to see the people and maybe some of the photos that we overlay, uh, then you can follow that channel. And I will post a link in the show notes for you. Before we get going, I just want to say this special episode is brought to you by the Organic Growers School in North Carolina, where I will be in a couple weeks presenting two half-day talks. Join Organic Growers School for their spring conference at Mars Hill University in Western North Carolina, March 8th through 10th. 2024. The spring conference happens over three days with over 60 workshops organized into 13 themed tracks such as mushrooms, cooking, gardening, farming, and living on the land. Plus, I will be there, like I said, leading half-day workshops on living soil. So you won't want to miss it. Uh, whether you are a home grower, food system advocate, or have a few farming years under your belt, this conference has something for everyone. Uh, for more information, visit organicgrowerschool.org slash spring conference. All right. Cheers to this amazing uh, conversation with Max Epstein with Krautkart. Max Epstein, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks for thanks for reaching out. I uh, thank you a lot for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I've been wanting to get you on for a long time. I really appreciate the work that you've that you all do over there, and I'm excited to sort of share the, some of that with the audience. So. Um, maybe we could start there. Maybe you can describe a little bit about uh, Krautgart and, you know, in terms of like your location, maybe a little bit about your climate and those sorts of things. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, we're based in we're based in Luxembourg, um, uh, which is a very, very small country between uh, yeah, uh, Belgium, France and and uh, Germany. And if we would say. Um, let's say we would be in a zone 8A or 8B-ish where we produce. Um, it depends on the frost of the winters. It's never it's never the same, but it should be like the zone 8-ish thing. And usually our growing season uh, is... Well, okay. The growing season, we, we don't have any winter crops. So we at Krautgart, we have a big winter break. So we don't have any storage crops or anything live in the fields or in the tunnels while we break down for winter. So our growing season is um, usually between uh, between beginning of February till end of December. And our, and our frosts, our frosty period is usually from the 1st of October, sort of, plus or minus, and it ends only until the 15th of May. So up until the 15th of May, we can get frosts. Um, so it's a pretty long winter and a pretty long uh, off season, pretty long shoulder season to deal with. And uh, and so our planting season usually starts with the equinoxes, which is pretty nice here in Europe. Uh, you have really these, these, uh, these dates throughout the year that really are significant for, for the vegetable growing. I mean, at your place, it's probably the same. You have these dates in the calendar that says you now it's time to seed now it's time to plant and for us it's uh yeah between the end of march and the end of september where we do plantings we grow on 3500 square meters and we use the classic uh, 30 inch beds and we use 15 meter lengths we don't like to have too big of beds it's easier to plan and um it just happens to be also very nice for our size of our production. Uh, so 15 meter beds, 30 inch beds, and we have now we got 600 square meters of uh, protected space, uh, all cold tunnels, so no heated greenhouse, uh, plus another 100 square meters of uh, nursery space. 
because we're doing all of our plant sets uh, ourselves. And um, what else for technical info could be interesting? Yeah, on those 3,500 square meters growing space, we roughly pump out 15 tons of mass of vegetables totally. So 15 tons is the annual harvest, more or less. And all of this uh, goes, basically all of it goes to our CSA. So Corral Guard is basically a 100% uh, CSA subscription-based um, production. Nice. Okay, so you're doing, what did you say, 100, 150 CSAs? 155 this year, yes. And that's all vegetables exclusively? That's all vegetables. I mean, we have some berries and some, I mean, a lot of herbs, obviously, too, but no fruits. We have a lot of fruit trees, but they're all pretty young. And uh, we have very different uh, varieties of fruit. So somehow each year somebody else has problems and we never uh, managed to get a real fruit harvest to distribute among, among our subscribers, which is a little sad, but yeah, we keep on it because we have... We have many trees planted, and technically they could one day uh, crop, but until now we don't have uh, that much of luck with fruit. Um, we had experiments uh, in the in the first few seasons. We had uh, we had laying hens, a uh, hundred layers for for the subs too, which we sold while while the distributions were happening. So that was pretty nice. Uh, but it was a little problematic because nobody's living on the farm. So we, if you have animals next to a nursery, that makes two more drives back to the farm to care for the chickens, plus the the, the young plants in the nursery also on the weekends and stuff. So it's a lot of organization just to, you know, feed the chickens. Uh, so in the end, we decided to um, to just buy the eggs in and don't produce any eggs anymore. Uh, for a year we had some broilers too, like the Joel Salatin kind of style where you have these, these, these flat cages on the ground on pasture where you move them every day. Um, we did some experimenting with that too. But in the end uh, it was the same deal. It was, uh, we had to do a lot of them to really have a second business uh, going on. And nobody really was that into, you know, farming chickens and slaughtering and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so we, it, it just stayed with the experiment too. So yeah, all, all of it is uh, vegetables basically. Can you break down how that CSEA distribution works? I know that some people will take everything to a farmer's market and then distribute it that way and let people pick their own. Or some people will deliver baskets directly to people or boxes directly to people's houses or they'll come to the farm like how does your csa distribution work yeah well uh, from the beginning on we decided against delivery because we were we were sure that if we start with delivery you never get off it again so uh, we decided in the beginning to um to make people come to us and by now with uh, the size of csa we have now because we kind of worked our, ourselves up to these 150. So we didn't, we only started in the first year with 30. And every year the garden grow, grew a little bit. So we took a little more uh, subscribers in. So now we have three distribution spots. One is at the garden, straight for, for like the neighbors around the garden. They can come by themselves and pick up their ready packed box in our um, walk-in freezer, a uh, walk-in cooler. Um, so that's about 20 shares or something that come directly to the garden. Then we have a distribution spot in the southern part of the country where my business partner is from. So he has a lot of friends and family. And uh, so we had the need to also somehow deliver some vegetables from our spot to, to his spot where he's from. And right now it's 40 members there and 90 members come to our big spot uh, at the barn. And it's basically um, that you come with your box, with your bags, and it's it's all built up in boxes. So the vegetables are all lying there. We have, sometimes we have bunches, we have uh, scales laying around too, or just to count, you know, one or two. 
I don't know, one or two broccoli heads or one cauliflower. And so you come and then we have, like in the supermarket, you just have tables on top of the boxes, like blackboards. And then we mark the, the ration for each member on the board. And then you make your, make your tour around the vegetables. And in the end, you get everything you need. And then you can, uh, can leave because it is, yeah, it is paid in advance. But during the distribution, we also have a little, you know, a little coffee table, a few coffee tables sitting around where people can chill and discuss things and have a coffee or have a drink. We also sell a few basic products next to the vegetables, like olive oil and vinegar, you know, just stuff that fits with the vegetables or eggs or mustard, honey, things like that from local producers. We try to source them or strictly source them from local producers that fit our yeah our philosophy or something and uh, we have some flexibility uh, for people to exchange vegetables if they if they absolutely don't like the spinach and uh, or could i maybe take double the carrots for the spinach that sort of stuff we try to make possible for people because we think that's the biggest sickness of a csa system because you kind of take the choice from people and some people are very open to that and like to experiment in the kitchen even with stuff they don't know so uh, a little flexibility too but uh, yeah it's pack your own come with your bag pack your stuff and leave well what does that flexibility look like are you picking an extra 10 bunches of carrots or like what what is there like a specific technique that you've landed on yeah, well, in the beginning, we just did it like that. We just had an extra 10 rations picked from everything and then just gambled that in the end, it's it's fine. It will balance out. People have different tastes and it, it will balance out. But in the end, it turned out that we have we had a lot of excess crops, which we are not prepared to, to, to deal with just after the distribution on Friday. Usually it's then weekend time and we don't have anything to have a regular, you know, uh, to sell these uh, surpluses so now we installed uh, boxes empty boxes basically that we just prime with some sort of vegetable and then it's like an exchange system so you come and next to the next to the spinach box uh, there is in the box there is a bunch of carrots and uh, you know maybe a salad head lying in there and then you can take your spinach ration put it in there take a salad out so then we get a little a little uh, thing going there but it's it's not it's really not that easy to to deal with it because there is always people that kind of abuse a little bit so they take stuff out without putting stuff in or they didn't understand it properly so communication is also not not very easy when you have so many people going through and some are fast some don't talk at all and some are very chatty and it's not. It's really not easy. But the exchange box system seems to be the way to go. It just needs to, yeah, a little more refinement still. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I'm curious about just sticking kind of with the marketing thing. How has this? Is the CSA common there in Luxembourg? Is that like um, you know, a common way of selling your vegetables? And then the second part of my question would be: Do you have a hard time filling up your CSA every year? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the first question is a little, it's a big one because, uh, well, Luxembourg is very small and uh, we, in Luxembourg, we only produce 5% of the vegetables consumed in Luxembourg. So 95% of vegetables is kind of imported. So we don't have many big producers, all the big producers, so really all of them are just dealing with uh, how you call that wholesale so you, you you sell all your stuff to one big supermarket thing and then you're done and we have very few growers that actually go to a market because there are no markets in Luxembourg I mean there is one or two in town and some of them are somewhere every three weeks one day one day so there isn't really a platform where a grower like us could on a regular basis get rid of so many vegetables uh, compared to a CSA 
So the growers do the same thing that, that we do. So manual work, the nodic system, um, they all went on that train too. Because we were the, uh, the second CSA in Luxembourg. And since we started, there's five or six and more and more and more that come. And we are all kind of a community. So everybody knows each other. And um, uh, Terra is the, uh, the first CSA in Luxembourg. They started 214. And ourselves were kind of the, the pioneers in that thing. And then people that came into that sector of you know market gardening, which wasn't really a thing before that, they uh, were inspired by how we do it. And in the end, there is not a real alternative uh, yet to, to get rid of so many vegetables. So yes, this, the, the, the market gardeners in Luxembourg, they kind of all have uh, CSA. Some of them have a little, um, a little stand before their farm to sell stuff, but the, the main vegetables, they move through CSAs. And the second question, um, I would say, I'm never sure because we kind of get stuck at two thirds every year. And I never remember when we get stuck. Is it before Christmas? Is it after Christmas? But in the end, we, the last three years or four years, uh, we were full before the season started, which is yeah, what you, what you want to expect. We never had um, open subs after uh, after harvest season began but it's slow it's not as fast as we would like it to be even though we don't have much fluctuation so we have uh, 70 plus percent or 75 plus percent that stay and only need 25 percent new customers but you know it's it's winter it's dark there's no sunshine nobody thinks of vegetables uh, you know then then the school holiday is over and as soon as the sun starts to appear you know end of february the first warmer days in march then we get a little peak again for subscriptions but it's always a little uh yeah spicy Hey, I just wanted to jump in real quick and explain a really cool part of the CSA system that we were talking about that we actually neglected to talk about at the time. It's uh, Krautgart's Solidarity Contribution System, what they refer to as Soliba. This uh, gives their CSA members the autonomy to set the price of their vegetable baskets from a minimum price that covers basic needs to a higher tier supporting fair wages and sustainable growth. This Soliba has uh, helped them to ensure accessibility for everyone while cultivating uh, positive change in their community. Max told me that this system enables Krautgart to invest in eco-social impact initiatives that they think are an important extension of their everyday work. So it's kind of a transparent pay what you can model. Very cool for a CSA. All right, back to the interview. I to know a little bit about the business side of like how the structure of it because it you know a lot of times farmers are just starting their own farms right their family farms or it's just them or it's just them an employee or something like that but you all went more of a cooperative model can you talk a little bit about that uh to not make it too long because it's a pretty if it's every year so many so many changes but uh, we started as a trio okay and uh we were all from university nobody had uh, family house or big, you know, big responsibilities. So my friend and I, we had that stupid idea back in the day to start the thing. And then very fast, we had a third one starting with us. So we started at a trio and we were all, you know, students. We all came from university. And um, in the beginning, it was pretty uh, automatic to find, to make decisions to how to how to proceed in the business to open a business was the first the first challenge uh, anyways but uh, the our ways were very parallel and we had a lot of momentum and we went in one direction and as soon as we what we felt that we were kind of getting installed and didn't have to think so much about the day-to-day -day business and really decisions that had to be done day by day we started to get different ideas. We had our roles in the business. One was more the administrative guy. I was, I was the plant guy, you know, the crop planning guy. And the other one was still 
in between because he was working elsewhere. Um, so then it started to feel that uh, we needed to, uh, yeah, the business decisions came to, to the table and it was a very different thing suddenly to not be okay with everybody else's opinion and uh, and ideas and, and, and development plans and where do we want to go and um, uh, how do we see each other in three years and that kind of stuff. And then the first kids came in and then these differences between the three of us, they got bigger and bigger and bigger until one of the three uh, split it off, so to speak. So we kind of developed ourselves apart from each other. We still are friends and no problem there, but in the business was a hard time to get along. The garden is pretty small. We have three big heads talking, discussing, needing to make decisions. And it was, the vibe was kind of uh, bad suddenly. So yeah, we, uh, the plus with the three, with the trio is, I, in my, in my opinion, is that we had each other to start the business. We didn't have to do everything by ourselves. Uh, we didn't have to push out, you know, 18 hour shifts for two years or all of these nightmares that you hear from left and right, how people start their farms and uh, how much work it can be for if you are just by yourself. So that gave us, I think, the momentum, the three of us in a very small business that we needed to to uh, to get more or less, um, I don't want to say easy, but it could be because it wasn't very easy, but comfortable, you know, we didn't, like I said, we didn't have a year of 12, 14, 16 hour shifts. Um, so that was very important to have different kinds of um, uh, capabilities and, and sweet spots to care about and to think about. Uh, and now, since last year, we are only two business partners. And the thing is now my business partner is basically in the same boat than I am. We both have kids now, so uh, we have. It is easier for for us to to have to make compromises and understand each other of what is needed to for the family and for the, you know, if something happens with the family, you're out basically. And I and the one that stays has to deal with that, and um, that can be can be a very bad time for a kid to fall sick in the you know, in the daycare thing. If it's the wrong day, it can be, it can be dramatic for the whole, for the whole week. So, I, and I think for that, the cooperative mode is, uh, yeah, it is, it is, it is challenging, I guess, because there is no clear hierarchy too. There is no boss in the garden and you don't have only employees or your wife in the business, but you have two separate families involved in one thing. Um, so it's a challenge, but it is also a very good thing, I think, because, um, yeah, you're not by yourself. You, you don't have to make all of the decisions by yourself. Yeah. And you, so you don't have any employees between, besides the two of you. And then you said your partners are not working in the business either. Yeah. Oh, uh, we have, we have one, we have two apprentices, like official from X school in Luxembourg that learn a vegetable grower. Uh, two of them in the business and one full-time employee. One full-time employee sort of sort of filled the gap from the the third of the partners. And then, how? I mean, you mentioned like one of the biggest issues with farming with kids is is sometimes like kids get sick. That's stressful on every level. It's stressful to you personally. It's stressful to your business. I mean, are there things that you've learned in terms of like farming? with a family that you feel like would maybe be helpful for people that are getting into it with a family? I think to, yeah, some advice, it's very difficult because I think I would have an, right now I would have an easier time if I would be living on the farm, but I'm not sure. I never lived on the farm. I never could, you know, if thing, you know, mom is, mom is cooking dinner and dad just hushes out 20 minutes caring for the nursery and then hushes back in. 
that's for me sometimes it's like a dream scenario because I have to take the damn car and go to the garden and calculate uh, just for a two minutes manipulation and switch off the lights and turn the turn out um, whatever the heater. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I. But I well the advice would be very positive. I mean, if you're a farmer, you are some how flexible as long as you don't have animals. I think the plants, they can deal with a lot of stuff. And if you know your plants, you know your garden, you know what you can juggle a little bit or wait a day or wait two, three hours. So I think the flexibility of being a farmer is very great, especially when your partner is working in nine to five job thing, because then you can yeah, you can you can take you can be the difference of mom having to take a day off just because of the kid because dad has his own five, nine to five job and can't pick up the kids from daycare. So if you know if something happens and uh, daycare is calling, a hey, uh, Lotta has something whatever, then I can say in the garden, okay, well fine, I pick her up, and then I say Claude. I'm sorry, I gotta leave. And then Claude says, okay, no, no worries. Next time it's me. <laughs> so you got this. Uh, and I think this is very cool, especially when they are small. I have only have one kid. Uh, she's um, three years now. And I think during that phase, it's really awesome when they're not going to school uh, to, uh, to be that flexible. But I would love to, yeah, put my house onto the farm and see how that goes because I think there's many hours that you can yeah to, to get the family more involved I think is very important too and I and I hope that I don't miss out on it to especially with the kid and with mom have these experience in the garden in the nursery planting harvesting uh, I, I hope that I don't miss out on too many of them because the garden itself I mean I don't, you're also working without machines, right? No, no, everything manual. We have a BCS tractor, uh, like a walk behind, but otherwise, yeah, everything is, we don't have like a large tractor. We don't do a lot of machine work. So for a young kid, it's just the perfect playground. There's so many things to discover, so many, so many cool things and the vibe in the garden is good. So also for me to take the kid to the garden is uh, not a problem at all. And I think it's very precious to have that sort of thing to to have the family experience uh, good things yeah absolutely and maybe you mentioned this so forgive me if you did uh how long is the drive to your like what's the distance between where you live and where you farm i'm very lucky that it's by car it's only five minutes and by by bike it's 10 minutes yeah it's not far but uh, i'm convinced as long as you have to get out of the house and go to an another place which is not up the road it is in your head and in your planning when you're planning your weekend with your family it's always oh i have garden shift today and tomorrow and you have to plan it in otherwise you wouldn't have to plan you just go out irrigate the nursery and you're done it's not a you don't have to talk about it but uh, for that it's i think that is something that also other people um are not putting enough pressure on is that to me especially here in Luxembourg and the neighboring regions I think it's it, it has to be some some future model to have one one part of the family being involved in the normal system like we like to call it and other one being a farmer so the the dream scenario of having a family farm and a farmhouse and everything is just around is not really realistic for my part of the world and I think it's uh, uh, it's it's got to be something that people talk about how how do you manage a farm while just having rented land your other partner having a nine-to-five job how to juggle these situations is that because it's just the price of land is so high there is it just not nobody selling like what what are the sort of limitations the limitation definitely is the the land um, we have 
farmers are decreasing, so the farm account is decreasing every year dramatically, and farms get bigger and bigger. Even in Luxembourg, a big farm, you know, you, you probably need 10 Luxembourg is big farm to have a medium farm in, in the US, probably. I'm not really sure. But farmland is very, I don't want to say it is scarce, but it is very valuable too. And uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, Spe speculation you know f farmers they don't um they know that the land is valuable and there are as many parts of luxembourg which get speculated that maybe need to get built on in the future and the prices for that is just astronomical and on the other side farmers are very uh, i don't i don't want to talk uh, too bad <laughs> about them now but um uh, they live on the subsidies. I mean, it's everywhere in the world that is just like that. They and they get paid by the sheer number of acreage they have. And uh, so even if they, even if the the, the 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 loss of money which they have, which they which they lose by giving me half an half an hectare, so 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 an acre of land. Even if that's not the problem, the problem is to re the paperwork for them to rewrite everything which they managed in the past year and if they sell to me a strip of that land which i which i would like then it's very complicated and very bureaucratic for them to do that and so most of them they just say yeah well no i just i'm not interested in selling so they just don't have that that I think they, they miss that value of the square meter. They just think in big numbers. And if I see an acre of land, I see, you know, tons of vegetables. And I think farmers nowadays, they, they lost that a little bit, the, the real value of even a small piece of land. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's similar to the United States too. I mean, it's the incentive here is very much the same where it's your incentive is not to necessarily sell it. And it's not the culture. People aren't, thinking that they should sell land. They're thinking, how do they get more land, even if they're not making money? Um, and it would be nice to see that change because it's not helping anybody. I, you know, There's so many people in America, too, that are looking for land and don't have access to it. So, um, And I know it's even harder there where you all have so much less land. Uh, so, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, a, that's a real uh, problem everywhere. Yeah. And, then, and private, uh, private owners, too. I mean, um, private owners, they... It's so in their heads and, like you say, in the culture that you don't take away land from a farmer. Even if it means, hey, you, you, you don't take it away from a farmer, you take it away from a farmer that is, you know, raping your, your, your land for generations and giving it to young uh, entrepreneurial farmers that really make use of the land in a proper way. But people don't really understand that because they don't they don't have any we're in a niche within a niche. We're so the, the movement is yet so small that if you like the normal dude from 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 the street, if you talk about market gardening and you know uh, no till and no dig and the importance of soil, you know, it's like okay. And uh, yeah, we yeah, we talk to many people that owned land and they just don't want to sell for no specific reason. It's just like, oh, no, we that, that farmer rented it for 20 years now. We don't intend to take it away from him, no matter what you are doing. Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, there, it, it's going to take a lot to make, uh, you know, a sort of culture change. I wish people would see the value of having, you know, you have these communities around the country in America and around the world that, like you said, farmers are leaving, right? So maybe giving up a small parcel of land brings in another family. And maybe that other family has kids that your kids are going to get along with and they're going to want to stay around longer because they don't have many people to play with. They don't have a lot of stuff, a lot of social interaction. So as those communities, you know, uh, start to lose their population, it just becomes less and less attractive to be there. So that's an incentive for people to sell some small percentage of their land. Also, maybe it brings in a flower grower who brings in pollinators and beneficials that help protect your crop. You know, it's, it's all the things. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know, I, I only elaborate on that because I want people to hear it and maybe start, you know, developing that same viewpoint um, that there's a benefit. There's a benefit to you as that grower or that farmer to sell maybe or, or at least lease for long periods, large parts of your land that you aren't using or aren't using very well. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a, you know, definitely something that needs to be, uh, needs to change. And, you know, there are, I mean, it's, uh, I, I do want to talk a little bit. You mentioned like the no dig and no till stuff. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about your garden management, like what, um, you know, how the gardens were set up and then maybe just describe a little bit about like your system. Yeah. We using, I don't know if it's, a, if, if, if it's a term in, 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 in the U S too already, but the, the no dig system and we followed the system we, well, we, got to know it by Charles Dowding uh, from the UK, like one of the, the legends. Um, and we set up the garden. Uh, to us here in Europe, it is said it's the classic way. I don't know how you guys in the US deal with it, but it's we started on pasture. So it was just a, 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 a mowed pasture. So the farmer just went over it two times a year, cut the grass and uh, and be done with it. And then applied uh, a thin layer of cardboard. So these cardboard rolls, which you get on these very thin ones for packaging, rolled it out and put on put 15 centimeters of compost on top of the, the cardboard. And um, yeah, formed our big plots with it. Our, our plots are, well, they have different sizes, but um, yeah, we have plots between 12 and 17 beds and uh, wood chip paths in between. But that's only the initial layer. So that's really to set up the garden. You start with the naked pasture, uh, mark out your, your big plots, apply the, the cardboard and the compost, a little compactation, and then uh, just sow and plant straight into it. And then after, the, after that first application, you, I mean, we, we go down to one application per year, even now. No bed gets twice, gets two compost applications per year. And then uh, year after year, we add two inches, sort of, yeah, two inches of compost uh, on every bed. And every year or every other year, we uh, re re redo the uh, wood chip paths in between the, the beds. Uh, what we learned uh, from that is really, uh, well, two things. One thing is in the beginning, I was more that to have pasture underneath is sort of yeah, optional. You could also take just the farmer's field next door, a naked field, apply the compost and boom, magic is there. Everything grows. That's turned out to be not the case because the initial life, um, within the pasture and within the, the soil horizons and all of these uh, layers in the pasture, they are kind of the, I see it right now as the, 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 the incubator of putting that life also into that compost, which the compost that we can buy is more or less dead as it is uh, produced way too fast. And we don't have compost experts and it gets treated like wa like a waste product. So no real, quality uh, quality control on what they the compost are actually pumping out uh, so the pasture underneath is really important to get that life straight into the compost plus the plants that you are planting and sowing in uh, is not a detail and that compost quality i mentioned it already is yeah sadly it's really not good and it's difficult for people to start it because we have we, we know two two guys that started the farm and they did the same thing that we did uh, nine years ago, bought it from the same producer and nothing grew. It was so woody and, and, and full of plastic and really, really crappy compost. And then you have these 50 tons of compost lying there and you don't know what's going on. So compost quality is a big yeah, a big risk when you when you when you set up a no dig farm, I would say, and I'm not really sure how you want to test your 
compost beforehand to say, okay, I buy this compost. I mean, there are some some tests about germination or covering it up and measuring CO2 levels or something to 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 um, to know what and what state the compost actually is. But um, that's a problem. You it's basically a surprise if you get your your compost your compost heap per year, and that's a big problem. Um, uh, yeah, and then I said I said already only one compost layer. I know there are many different growers that apply compost after each crop, which I think is totally almost abusive of the of the material. It is way I I don't think it is an any any fertility problem will appear if you if you only apply compost once or twice a year. You definitely don't need four compost applications per year, fertility-wise. It's just the weed pressure-wise or uh, um, consistency of the surface to plant or some things like that. And I think it's not a good idea to to use compost just to just because it is still cheap right now to use it. Um, I don't know the, the term in English to just use it because you because it's cheap. Mm. And on top of that, we don't have any uh, any fertilization other than the compost application once a year. So we, we never fertilized any tomato, any any eggplant, any pepper, any cabbage. Everybody gets the same treatment. If it's a carrot, a salad, a cabbage. Um, there's no difference, and that I I talk to many people about that. That is really something where people are uh, start to get to oh, and that does is that enough? Does that work? And apparently it, it does work. I never saw I never saw deficiencies or or you know it 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 just grows if you come if if you if you have good compost, uh, for us it works. I don't need any extra fertilization. I'm not saying that caliber or, or fruit production will, it would increase with the proper application of some fertilizer at, at a good point in the season, definitely. But it's not that you need to fertilize after you use the, the Nodic system. And you mentioned that first year being a little bit um, you know, like maybe the fertility wasn't quite there. Can you talk a little bit more about like what that first year was like and then how you saw that change? Uh, yeah, well, the, f the first year, the biggest problem was our compost was pretty dry when we got it. And to get a dry compost wet in a dry spring was a big challenge because, you know, dry compost is hydrophobic, basically. And... Um, when some some regions of the compost get wet, you get these. You have to imagine it to look on it from the top, and you get these water bubbles within the plot. And if you irrigate during sprinklers or whatever you use, these water blobs they kind of grow. But next to that blob, it can be still dead dry. So we had a lot of problems to have an even moist bed. But um, well, after some. After some months, probably in summer, we started to feel that the connection really was there. So from the fresh compost, cardboard and ground, uh, like half a year after the application, we really saw that things got moving. When we when we dug out carrots, we had the first carrots that ha that were half black and, and half brown. So they really go through and into the, um, the fresh ground. And then, but after... After two seasons, we had a mixed horizon of about five centimeters already, and we were like, wow, that was pretty fast. We didn't think that so much stuff is moving down there. And as we realized how quickly it, how quickly it, it, it mixes itself just by, just by yeah, the soil biology, um, we got very confident that it has to go better and better and better and better, and that's what we see. Also, so harvests are really trending up um, throughout the, throughout the vegetables that we grow, and by now we are at 25 centimeters. So we have that 
thin mulch layer that we add. You see that pretty good even in the um, in the autumn. And then the mixing horizon is basically homogeneous on 25 centimeters after eight seasons, which is every time I put a spade in, we don't do it often, but uh, it's it's amazing how it gets mixed in and then how the how the, the the plot keeps water to and all of these things magic. Yeah, and we noticed yeah. that too when we were doing uh, heavier mulches, and then a similar application. Like we'd do a large application in the very beginning, and then we'd add like, you know, two inches ish every season. Um, yeah, and we just saw that same thing where it just like basically yeah sinks ten or twelve inches, like ten inches I think is your twenty five centimeters. Um, and so yeah, that's uh you know that's what we saw too, um, and are there crops that you found do better in that system than others? Or are there, I guess a different way of asking that question would be, are there crops that you feel like don't respond as well to the deep compost? Uh, yeah, well, difficult to say. I don't have um, real experience of using uh, tilled soil or, or working compost in. Uh, I don't have any experience. So, but I can't, I can say for sure that I didn't encounter any crop where I said, oh, that doesn't work in no dig. So yes, I, totally, everything works, in my opinion. Even potatoes, I mean, there's so many things that gardeners or growers think they need to do just because it is so, it's become a tradition and almost dogmatic to have potatoes in heaps, you know, to have these to move a lot of earth around the potato is completely useless if you if you are on a human scale manual scale growing environment you don't need these things for the potato to go well but um so that was probably the the biggest thing now talking about it that there are so many myths around in serious garden books what you have to do with certain crops to uh, that they are well and timings and frost resistances and just by trial and error you 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 if by trial and error you 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 start to see hey that's that's not the case or that's only the case if or that's not we don't really need to do that in our context and i think the no dig is really a key thing in that uh, in all of these things because that that healthy soil life i think just checks off so many so many things uh, that a grower needs to do for the crop to 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 succeed that um i don't even realize how many good things i do or the right things i do just by having that undisturbed uh, soil and I don't even want to understand anything because everything seems to be a, just a rabbit hole. If you try to get down to what was the problem with that crop of carrots in June? What was the problem? I have the feeling you, you just never know. <laughs> and so are you growing things like, you know, a lot of CSAs on your scale are buying in potatoes, are buying in winter squash and those sorts of things. Are you growing all those crops or are you buying some of those in? Uh, potatoes, uh, we buy in. Um, it feels a little sad, but for that many people, we can't really produce them on a, in, in, a, in a sensible way. It just, just doesn't make any sense. And um, But else, squash, we produce ourselves. Not enough. It's always a thing of the season and, and the varieties. Uh, we, think, we always think we have, we have enough, but we never have enough. Uh, but yeah, potatoes we buy in. And some of the crops we... Mm, I mean, the potatoes are pretty expensive too. That's uh, that's one thing that keeps triggering me every time. We, it, I think it's dollars, it's probably 15,000 euros worth of potatoes <laughs> that we buy in. And I think that's a lot of... That's, uh, that's a lot of money too. But on that scale, we give every member one kilo, so two pounds of potatoes with every share. Because the Luxembourgers, they are potato eaters. And I think it's a basic thing for people to buy constantly. And we thought, uh, let's give them a good ration of potatoes every week. 
And plus, we, we started by growing potatoes. So our first growing experience was purely potatoes, manually, <laughs> by hand. So we have kind of a nostalgic uh, relation to potatoes, too. Yeah, so one kilo would be like 2.2 pounds for, for uh, those of us who do not use metric. Um, and yeah, that's a decent amount. I mean, that's a lot of potatoes. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, because we mentioned it just before um, jumping on here, was your DIY greenhouse sort of setup. So your propagation house. Can you talk a little bit about that for people who maybe think you have to have all the fancy stuff to <laughs> get a greenhouse going? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a topic on several conferences where we were guests or invited people struggling to get plants going. And um, so the DIY factor is, um, uh, well, the, the first thing is m many people don't have, when they start off a farm, to, to buy a nursery, a heated nursery is sort of the the... the the top, the top of the notch, the to the go-to thing. So that's real, a real expensive stuff. And then uh, how do you, how do you deal with that if you don't have a heated space, where you have to grow plants uh, that need heat in the early spring to get going? Well, then you buy. Then we said, okay, you just build low volume boxes which are insulated and heated separately. And uh, that was the idea, and I got to know that system through a um, through a guy where I had a little crash course on growing um, growing plants, and he all his life used that way too, and from the beginning we were kind of blown away by the efficiency and how how safe it is too if you have proper electronic uh, um, connections everywhere, and how how low the electricity use is too to have a, a low volume box uh, heated. So, and we work with, um, with heating cables, heating cables in isolated boxes with a translucent um, cover so that the sun can actually go into. And um, uh, with, that's maybe a, a good tip. Many people use, when they use heating cables, they use sand as as what as heat body so wet sand to where the heat from the cable goes in and then you get an equal heating platform but the sand is really the problem that it is so heavy and gets gets green quick and you have animals in there and uh, and ants also so we use these uh these carpets that um paint, painters use you know to not to not get the floor all ugly these these recycled carpets there from clothes and stuff double layer them in there put the cable in between wet the whole thing and then you have basically a wet carpet as a heating platform and then just put plastic on the top on the carpet so the plants don't root in there and then the translucent cover and uh, so that's basically our system we have we have different tables uh, and also some of them are illuminated too and not by fancy um, sodium, sodium, high pressure sodium lamps or you know super fancy LEDs but just LED bars that you can put in any kitchen that you can buy in any hardware store uh, like these 10 to 15 watt things and just put a bunch of them onto a grid very close to the plants and it is all a plant needs until it gets to some more adult form or size and that combined with the heat i mean you get you get plants going in three weeks in deep in the deepest of winter and that saves us a lot of time and a lot of weak seedlings um, so the illumination if you start early your season is really not an option if you really want to start early harvesting you need lights and but no expensive ones but the most important thing, I would say, from the DIY nursery to get good plants going, even if you don't have uh, isolated boxes, if you really have, just have a cold tunnel and some tables and some fleece to put over them to get, get rid of the worst frost damage, is to have proper germination. Because I think uh, 
no matter how you produce your plants, whether it be in a in a box where you prick them out or you have these these multi cells straight in, just seed seed by seed per cell. If you have if you don't have proper germination, then all of you get many problems in the in the following following time. And for that, we built uh, like an incubator. So basically, just an um, a, a cabinet from out of, out of wood, isolated with some styrofoam, a translucent front, and also heating cables, just running over platforms within the. It's basically like a big oven. We have platforms in there where you can put these uh, these quick pots in there, and they are dark. It is warm and you get perfect germination and uh, very fast. You you stack the plates in volume, not in the surface. So if your surface area of growing in the nursery is very limited, which we had the problem too, very very small nursery tent, then it's really nice to have them the, the, the quick pots stacked in volume instead of just in the surface. And you don't need to water any sowings twice which is also something that just drove me nuts. You wet, you wet your quick pot with your seed in, and then the sun hits the bare soil of your, of your quick pot, you get that crust in there, and you never know, okay, is it, is, it, is it wet enough? Does the seed manage to pop through that crust that forms on these, on these potting soils? Um, and by putting it into a cabinet, into the dark, is really nice on that, uh, uh, on that problem too. And for light germinators, which is not a, a, a really good term for that, it is, um, they just don't need full darkness. So a light germinator doesn't, doesn't need really saturated light, but it just doesn't like to be in total darkness. And that problem you just you take away by just having a translucent door where some radiation comes in, and that's fine for every light germinator too. And then, Controlled by thermostates, these, I don't want to shout out the name, but uh, I saw them also, I think in your nursery too, these standard ones, they work fine. Uh, yeah, but with, with everything, the best tip is probably, uh, you don't, I wouldn't want to start a nursery on the scale that we produce now. If you're new to everything and you have a, you plan your garden as 150 sub um, uh, CSA market garden you don't want to throw yourself into the plant growing madness with that amount of plants to produce so I think producing his own your own plants is really something that you need to either you're an expert you have yeah you, you know what you're doing you have experience and you can plan your new garden in that manner or you need to start small and then go bigger 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 as you manage your production which is our top rule, I think. Everything grew year by year a little bit um, because we are all we were all noobs in the beginning, so we didn't have any gardening school or something. So start small is probably the best thing. Yeah, that's cool, and I'll make sure to post a couple of those pictures too and add it to this video. But the um of the greenhouse and those tables are really interesting. Like having, they almost look like cold frames sort of. Yeah. yeah they basically are cold, cold frames on, on, on benches. Yeah. Uh, one other thing, just before we go, I noticed in one of the pictures you sent me and I'll again, post that as well. Um, you're pretty up against like a conventional, it looks like some sort of conventional tillage operation, maybe grains or something right next door. Can you talk about that situation? Like just being so close to, like a conventional, what looks like a conventional agriculture op operation? Yeah, well, uh, that strip that you see on that picture is basically the strip that we wanted, wanted to have for a couple of years, just to extend a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I mean, what should I say? It, 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 it sucks. It sucks because, uh, you know, in the beginning you, you meet and then you say hi and the, and the guy hardly comes down from his from his tractor to talk a little bit and then what are you doing there and, do, 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 do. and then we say hey we're kind of producing here fine vegetables can you watch the wind and watch the the weather a little bit before you do certain interventions and stuff 
but then reality hits and we got you know southwesterly wind coming in and the guy the guy uh drives through his crops with who the hell knows what chemical and it drives over to us and we can just hope that it doesn't hurt our crops and that he at least respects us in that way that he doesn't yeah intentionally uh damages our crops but um it's very sad to to be that close to something and we are basically working the same soil as he does and we are uh, during the season we always make uh, comparisons you know we go to our no dig beds and then put a shovel in or after a rain run over our beds and then we go to the neighbor's field and you stick that far into the mud and the spray of uh, cargamon i mean the, the standard the standard uh, NPK fertilizer that everybody uses for like every crop. He's fertilizing our pasture too. Um, we have a big tunnel at least against the border, so when he when he's uh, driving out fertilizer, then it often uh, it doesn't reach the garden because it's just he's throwing the stuff against against the plastic. And we are growing a big um, natural hedgerow between our plots, uh, which should also be a, a nice barrier for the future years. Uh, but yeah, there's no real relationship. I mean, he knows that we would like to get a little bit of his land. Uh, we went for pizza once, but there's no, there's no real uh, relation. So it's, uh, and some people, and, and some things that he's spraying, it doesn't, they don't smell good at all. And uh, yeah, but we didn't we didn't have any damage up until now, at least not on that side. We had damage on on another plot because we have two plots basically, uh, one small plot without irrigation, and that picture I sent you from the big garden. There we had some tomato damage, but uh, maybe also from the horse manure, which is also more and more coming out on social media that people have problems with. Uh, depending on what manure they use and yeah, herbicide traces and stuff. So yeah, there is no, no convincing um, relation or he, he, he never came to us and said, Hey guys, uh, yeah, let, let's talk about that strip of land. Never. It's always that more or less that uh, adversary uh, relationship. Yeah. Well, I don't want to end it on a on a note like that because I know that's that's just the tough reality of what we're doing. So maybe we can maybe give us one thing that you're like super excited about for 2024 that you're working on or that you're excited to see happen. Like you said, you have the fruit trees developing and those sorts of things. Like what's what's one thing you're excited about? Well, really cool is that we um, that would be the first season where we have more tunnel space than we would have the need for summer crops if that makes sense. So I can, for the first time, I don't need to plan my tunnels just with summer crops because I, if I would plant everything with summer crops, I would have too much of those. So for the first time I can have protected space that I can plan in a different manner and make spring way more interesting for people. The first harvest is very green, very reddish, you know, very herby and very salady and turnipy. So now we get more hot stuff in for the first four, six weeks of harvest. So that's really nice. The two tunnels is very nice. They act as windbreak too. So that's pretty cool. And one thing that I am challenged and also looking forward to is that I uh, am on parental leave this year. Um, so in Luxembourg, you got a good social system and I can, uh, even as an entrepreneur, I can... Um, take parental leave and I decided to do it this year half time. So it's going to be after, after eight years of full on gardening and doing it all the way. I have a little relief step back from the whole thing to, yeah, to, to have my kid around for two days, three days a week and have more stuff in the garden. So we, we hired somebody else to replace my working hours in the garden too. 
So that's going to be a big, a big experiment too of how it maybe can continue in the future, not being hundred percent involved in production, because right now there is no. My partner and I, we are in the garden every day, all day, doing stuff, and uh, it's going to be the first year where it's not going to be the case for me. <laughs> I, I like that. I mean, it speaks to kind of what you were talking about where, um, you know, you have a partner who maybe has a different job and then you have an agricultural job. Um, but then also being able to be supported a little bit to be able to, you know, raise your kid and, and have that part of your life too. Like, I feel like that's a nice, that's a really cool opportunity for you and a really nice balance. Like you Especially when your kids are oh, young, yeah. I mean, they grow fast, and you realize, like, oh, I've spent, I've missed a, out on a little bit of this, and that's frustrating. And I think it's there's a huge value to that. So, um, yeah, so good, so good on good on you. Well, congratulations on that. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Max, thank you so much for your time. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, love what you're doing, and like I said, I've been wanting to get you on the podcast for a while now. So I'm very excited to have had this conversation. Yeah, well, cool. Thank you. I enjoyed it too. Uh, it was the first podcast for me in that manner. And I would love to talk more about geeky stuff. Uh, but yeah, as you said, one farm, there's just so much things to talk about. But uh, yeah, before I leave, I need to put shout outs out. And that's one time to Felix Hofmann, the guy from Ed Gemüsekultur Heidelberg, the one that actually put, I think he put you on to uh, to contact us. It's two, three, four years back, one German guy. So shout out to Felix and shout out to uh, Antoine, our beloved friend and former intern who has now his own operation. And he told me to get back to you as I missed the first opportunity because it was not the time. And he said, hey, just write the guy back. he probably take you back on. So Antoine, that's for you. He's the at at Le Maricheur. So he's in, in France. A young guy too. So yeah. Well, that's that's great. And uh, hopefully, you now my book is being published in French and Italian. So I may have some incentive to uh, get back to Europe and, and do some farm tours. So hopefully we can maybe bring the cameras and we get to visit you and actually see some of the operation live in person. Hey, that would be great. All right. I hope you enjoyed that interview. Uh, you can follow Krautgart on Instagram. I will hook it up with links in the show notes. Also, make sure you are subscribed to the No-Till Growers podcast channel so you can see more videos like this one in the very near future. Support our work by picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook or a hat or other merch at notillgrowers.com or by becoming a Patreon member at patreon.com slash no-till growers. Come see me at the Organic Grower School or here at my home farm for one of our field days coming up in 2024. Tickets for that are at roughdraftfarmstead.com. Like this video if you like this video. If you're not subscribed to the channel, hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Otherwise, thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye.